My name is Nicolas Ponzvigno. I, uh, I work at the University of the Witwatersrand, Witz, in Johannesburg, South Africa. I'm a senior research fellow in a, in a small research uh, center called CSID, Corporate Strategy and Industrial Development. We do research on industrial policy mainly for uh, the South African government, so policy research to support the, the government's policy making. Uh, and we also teach uh, a number of development uh, studies and development economics courses. My own research has looked in particular at, uh, at the structure of the South African economy and the way in which uh, economic and in particular industrial policy can help transform it, uh, and also at issues of labor and development. So with a particular focus on how labor and employment are essential parts of any thinking about poverty reduction uh, in the context of Southern Africa. The presentation I gave here was really looking at a context of industrial policy in South Africa. Uh, I looked at how in effect, the industrial structure that the, uh, the ANC government has inherited from the apartheid in the previous periods of South Africa's history are heavily skewed towards uh, heavy industry, capital-intensive industries, uh, and finance, increasingly. Uh, these are basically incompatible with successful industrial development because there are very strong entrenched interests that oppose the development of uh, labor-intensive industries that would be able to absorb a very large number of unemployed people in South Africa. So I looked at the history, um, at, the, at the very contradictory recent developments that, have taken, that are taking place in South Africa. On the one hand, you have a part of the government, the newly appointed government, that is very supportive uh, of, let's say, productive policies, um, industrial policies, proactive trade policies, proactive competition policies to also try to reduce the price uh, of essential goods for poor people. On the other hand, there is still a very strong lobby uh, and interest group within the ANC, uh, which is against any excessive regulation of the economy, any excessive intervention of the state to, to reduce the skewing in favor of, of finance and, and big industries, if you want, big capital intensive industries. Um, so these contradictions, I think, are very interesting. And what I try to do is I try to give the participants some food for thought around the key challenges that South Africa, but I think other African countries face when it comes to thinking about how do we successfully design and implement a policy that can really deal with the structural economic problems that are keeping poverty at very high rates and preventing development from being inclusive. I feel really we need to get away from simplistic discussions of improve governance for its own sake, reducing corruption, uh, scoring better on a variety of indices despite um, the interest of the, the foundation that is supporting the school. I think what really matters is asking ourselves how do we get governments to focus on accumulation, to focus on wealth creation rather than focusing on predation, on dividing what there is uh, between the haves rather than trying to create more to share for, every, for everybody. I think this is a, a key question. Um, it has a number of, of components to it. One, of course, is who are the capitalists in a given country? Who are the capitalists? Uh, what are their relations with the labor, the labor movement, if there is a labor movement, and their relations with the state? What kinds of alliances are likely to bring about uh, a more inclusive form of development? So really, governance for development is not just you know, better governance seen uh, from the point of view of the end result. I think it's very important to have good governance, to have democratic states and all these things, but really what we need to, to get our heads around, especially in an African context, is how do we get production going? How do we get jobs created? And that really has a lot to do with, with the way in which governments interact with, with the private sector and with organized labor. Uh, and this is, I think, a, a very key challenge. It's, it's, it's a very, very difficult challenge. I mean, the participants in my session were pointing out that in many African countries, the same problems as in South Africa are, are prevalent. In, in other words, there is a lack of domestic capitalists who are focusing on accumulation and industrialization. One of the a research paper that was published in a, in a book that I had a, a contribution in called The Political Economy of Africa was by Boyce and Ndikumana. Ndikumana, I think, was for a while with the African Development Bank. And they talk about a very interesting phenomenon, which is the revolving door. The phenomenon that aid comes into Africa, goes, obviously, usually with a number of elites, and then goes out of the continent in the form 
of flows into tax havens, for example. So there's actually, Africa could be uh, a net creditor instead of being a net debitor to the world. If, if all of the money, both that comes into it and that is generated, for example, through mining, uh, was actually kept in the continent and reinvested for productive purposes. Uh, I mean, that's a key issue that you find in, in around the mining industry. Many African countries uh, have you know, benefited from the mining boom or the commodity boom, but only in so far as some mining activities have been located in their countries. Uh, in Mali, for example, the, uh, the mining industry, the gold mining industry in the south of the country is entirely tax exempt, so the government doesn't receive any tax revenue from it, and very few Malians are employed. There's also absolutely no beneficiation. So thinking around these issues, how do we get governance to support productive development, I think is very important. To conclude, I think it's very important also to stay away from judgmental views on, on, on African governance. Um, views such as African leaders are corrupt. Uh, this view is possibly true of many of them, but my wife is Italian. I don't think in Italy there's any less corruption uh, than in most parts of Africa. What, again, the difference is, is that in one case you have corruption, so political buy-in, which goes together with some level of production that serves the collective interest, that creates jobs and creates wealth. Okay, probably decreasingly so in Italy, in fact. Uh, in Africa, very often, there's very little production that takes place. And one of the problems is, of course, that there is a missing link. The class, the bourgeois capitalist productive class of people that would be the natural uh, group that would lobby in favor of policies that support them, very often does not exist. Uh, in South Africa, the, the policy of black economic empowerment has generated a large number uh, of financial capitalists who are very interested in moving their capital around and increasing their participation, but very, very little interested in developing the companies in which they have invested, or in developing companies that create jobs or invest in, in new productive capacity. Um, very similar phenomena have been noticed in Africa in the 60s and the 70s. As some industrial development was taking place, whether in Ghana, Nigeria, uh, Algeria and other places, um, there were also policies similar to what's called black economic empowerment in South Africa. Policies that very legitimately sought to change the face of capitalism in those countries, to get more indigenous local people um, to run capitalist enterprises. The problem there, as today in South Africa, is that instead of being articulated with productive and economic policies, in other words saying, let's change the face of our capitalists while developing jobs and industry and growth, a lot of these policies became tools of redistribution, tools of, of political payoff of certain groups, without being linked anymore with any productive policy. Um, I'm not suggesting I have a solution for this, of course, but I think uh, and it, it, it started to happen in today's session. If we start refocusing the debate on these sorts of issues, I think we, we probably will at some point find some very interesting insights into how we can, to use the phrasing of the question you asked me, uh, have a governance that really promotes development in Africa, rather than getting lost uh, in, 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 in the end, in fairly empty statements and empty recommendations, one-size-fits-all approaches, uh, which you may as well use in Africa or in Italy or in China, which, despite its amazing achievements in terms of production and poverty reduction in the recent past, is uh, a, one of the most corruption-ridden countries in the world, by any stretch of the imagination. Yet it works. So we need to go beyond those simplistic things and look at the class composition of these countries and how these class alliances and class compositions impact uh, on these countries' governance and their prospects for development. So far, the, the participants I've interacted with have been really interesting people. Um, I think it's, it's really useful to hold these sorts of schools. Uh, it's useful to, to expose critical people to, um, to very critical thinking on issues of, of development and governance. I also think there is a great value in bringing such groups of people together. Um, I really think some of, the, some of the core issues and discussions on African development need to be discussed across national boundaries by strategic people. I really believe in, 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 in stimulating debates between, between elites in Africa. Um, in fact, if I can mention this for a second, I run a, a yearly course called APORT, African Programme on Rethinking Development Economics, which seeks to do something very similar to this particular residential school, with a slightly stronger focus on economic development rather than governance. Uh, but I always find it very enriching because if there's one thing you can get out of a school like this, and it's enormous, 
It's actually to inspire people. Just as, I guess, many of us have been inspired by our studies in a place like SOAS, I think people who've come to these residential schools or to other, other similar um, initiatives have been inspired to do something, whether it's to change the curriculum that they teach, uh, whether it's um, to possibly take a different approach in their job if they work in a in Ministry of Finance or the Ministry of Social Development to try something new in terms of poverty reduction, for example, uh, or whether it's actually to decide to invest in building capacity either in their NGO, trade union, uh, or, in their, uh, or in their government department. If you inspire people who are sort of key people to do things and to, cha to change things, I think you've achieved a lot. So I think this, this sort of residential schools is actually a very, very important initiative.